Six, five, four. Oh, let's just go. Two, one. Ron Howard is one of the most successful Hollywood directors working today. His stable of movies include Cocoon, Splash, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and last year's Oscar champion, A Beautiful Mind. These films, produced with partner Brian Grazer, have grossed over two and a half billion dollars worldwide. Their 1995 suspense drama, Apollo 13, received nine Oscar nominations. It won two. This month, it returned to the big screen in IMAX format. This is the first live action picture to be digitally remastered for giant IMAX screen projection. Ron Howard joins me with Jim Lovell. I am pleased to have them. Jim was selected as an astronaut in 1962. He has logged more than 5,000 hours of flying time, more than 3,500 hours in jet aircraft. During Apollo 13, he served as spacecraft commander. He piloted Gemini 7, commanded Gemini 12, and orbited the moon on Apollo 8. He is the first man to journey to the moon twice. To top that off, the Oscar-winning actor Tom Hanks played Captain Lovell in Howard's film. I'm pleased to have them both here. What a nice introduction by me. Well, yes, it certainly <laughs> was. Can we, can, we, can we box that up and put it in a time capsule or something? Uh, did I tell you anything about him you didn't know? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm glad round you and did. round and round really and something. round. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations on the Oscar. Thank you. I really appreciate Just it. Just a director, huh? Yeah, well, it was a, that was a thrilling Walk uh, up thrilling there and night. say. That was great. And then, uh, and then uh, you know, the, a moment later, I, Mel Gibson ha handed me my Oscar. Then we walked off, and a moment later, Tom Hanks announces Best Picture. Which yeah. means an Oscar for for Brian yeah. and myself, uh, and uh, it was just uh, thrilling and so and really fantastic that Tom was there uh, to to share that moment with us. It was great. You two pretty close. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and 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 also Tom and Brian have been you know sort of surfing buddies over the years on yeah. top of everything else, uh, and uh, so it just uh, it felt great. It, it it was a it was a terrific. It was a terrific night. Yeah, people were waiting for you to get one because yeah. they thought you'd been cranking out one good movie after another. Well, and thanks. So, and we were waiting to see which movie would be I the one. I thought you should have got one six years ago. I know you did. I'm not off the Well, it's a, it's a great tradition. And look, it's you know, it's one. I'm a, I've always been a fan of the Oscars. And on the on the one hand, I was uh, proud of the fact that without without winning an Oscar, I, I was able to accomplish everything that I really wanted to in terms of, of working with people I wanted to work with, tell stories that I was interested in, get the support from the studio system that I needed to make the films the way I wanted to make them without the Oscar. So it wasn't like I, I felt I, I, I needed it uh, on, a, on a career level, but uh, you know, it's a fun tradition, it's great, and I'm glad I had that, that moment you know, as a result of that film. If I had to tell you that of all the movies you're about to make, and I listed them at the beginning of your career, and I said, A Beautiful Mind, the story, Mm. of a professor uh, who's schizophrenic yeah. would not be the one that you think might have done it for you. Well, you know, I, I am not good at predicting those things. I am, I am also not good at predicting the commerciality of the film. This was not a Hollywood movie. Not at all. And, and you know, you've got to give Universal and then DreamWorks, who came on board, a lot of credit for, for backing that movie and believing yeah. in it because it's not a formulaic picture by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and, uh, and we approached it in uh, you know, a very adult, kind of sophisticated way, and audiences embraced it around the world. I mean, that's, that's uh, thrilling, thrilling that the critics were with us and that the Academy voted for us, but, uh, but also really rather surprising that it was, that it was as commercial as yeah. it turned out to be. You. Have you seen this movie, Apollo 13 in IMAX? Mm -hmm. I saw it about three weeks ago. And what's and, it like? Well, it's fantastic because, see, I didn't have the... You've had uh, the three experiences. You were up there. You've seen it in the movie. Well, Rod now worked on IMAX. it, so he knew, you know, he watched it, you know, being pro uh, produced. I hadn't seen the regular Apollo 13 for some time. Right. I mean, we have it on DVD and things like that, but, you know, after a while, we don't, we don't show it anymore. <laughs> and suddenly I go to the IMAX theater. I oh, no, I've seen you at the supermarket. Say, hey, come over here and watch <laughs> me. <laughs> Bring my friends in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we sat there. So what a uh, great guy I am. In Chicago, they, they, uh, the fellow who had the IMAX theater there uh, said, would you like to see I have a private showing? I said, of the IMAX theater part of the He said, yes. And I said, well, fine. Can I bring my family? He said, oh, sure. Bring your family. I, I said, anybody else coming? He says, no. I said, well, how many seats does that place hold? And they, he said, 400. I said, can I invite some friends? <laughs> and so we had about 152 people. Oh, that's there. great. And, and this is the first time I saw it. So for me, it was a, you know, a, almost a completely different movie where you're really in the scenes itself. And of course, I can relate kind of nicely. I can almost put myself into Hanks' spot there oh, and okay. uh, see what's 
what's going to happen. Yeah. But so for me, it was especially thrilling. Neil, yeah, well, tell us what IMAX is. Well, uh, you know, as uh, IMAX is this large screen format um, and uh, 70 millimeter. They project it this way, so you've got more top and bottom. Right. Uh, and it's huge, tremendous sound system. Always, you know, uh, the stadium seating. Uh, uh, and and they generally show it's like stadium seating. Yeah, you know, instead of uh, it's you know this way, yeah, like coliseum right, right, uh, yeah. uh, uh, seating. Uh, not a bad seat in the house. Right. Tremendous sound systems, uh, as I said, and 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 they're, the idea of an IMAX movie is to just sort of immerse you in a world. And they do a lot of nature films. They do historical films, great films about you know the Grand Canyon. I mean, they're just they've been doing it for for a Climbing long time. Climbing Mount Everest. Climbing Mount Everest. Great great films. I've seen a number of them. Of course, as a father of a bunch of teenagers, over the years I've always gone, and and I've always been blown away, and always thought, wouldn't it be great to to, to you know to follow a narrative line in that format? Wouldn't it be great to to to, to shoot something for IMAX? And um, and and that opportunity never really uh, presented itself. I never had the right idea, uh, but when they when they came to us through Michael Rosenberg, our president at Imagine, who'd been talking to the IMAX folks, and Michael and the IMAX gang said, you know, we'd like to. We'd like to create a test. We have a new software which allows us to digitize the movie and blow it up and take out the grain, which means we can take the 35 millimeter negative and make it uh, as rich a quality and as textured and detailed as if we shot it with the IMAX cameras, which are huge and really preclude you from, from making a dramatic movie and, and, and doing camera movement and making us a, a sort of a contemporary cinematic experience, you know? Um, and I was, I was elated by that, but also rather guarded, because if I saw the test and it wasn't up to snuff, I knew the studio would be excited, uh, it might be re represent a commercial opportunity for the film, but Apollo 13 is one of my cherished babies, and I, I really was not gonna let it, um, um, you know, go out there and be a sort of, just a sort of a marketing gimmick, you know? Uh, but uh, that was not a concern. When I saw the test, I was completely blown away. So was Brian. And in fact, I remember thinking to myself as I was walking out, you know, I'd always dreamed about making an IMAX movie. Who knew I'd already made one? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is a perfect story for, for that format. The action scenes are more exciting. Uh, and, and the suspense is, you know, it's all more, more compelling. So the and software works. Oh, the software is spectacular, Charlie. I mean, it's incredible what it, it's, it's, as a movie lover, this is a tremendous breakthrough. It's just great. And, uh, uh, and I'm thrilled that, um, you know, the initial outing, it turns out to be Apollo 13. It's, uh, um, you know, the other thing that surprised me, you know, I love directing actors. That's, yeah. you know, primarily, that's what I love to, love to do. And, uh, and if I had a concern, it was that the movie, which has a lot of close-ups, because I really shot it as a human interest story, right. you know, as a character drama. I was afraid that the close-ups would overpower on that huge screen. And in fact, if there was, if there was a, a sort of an IMAX director's handbook, you know, big close-ups would sort of be in the no-no section. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but uh, the, when I was watching the test and they get to this close-up of Kathleen Quinlan looking up as, as the rocket launches, it's always been a favorite shot of mine, but you could see into her soul even more so. I mean, they're just this, the, the, the eyes, every nuance of, of these performances, which are very nuanced, because they're all playing characters who are kind of understated in that astronaut yeah. kind of way, you know. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's a richer drama in this format. All right, take it, we have that clip, rolled, not from IMAX, from, but from the movie, here it is. you felt oh yeah the uh my fourth flight and this big you know thing rumbled and rocketed and kept on going so that's put me right into it yeah and of course the regular movie did but i mean with, with yeah with, the imax with, thing the, is the imax <laughs> thing you're sitting there and you're surrounded by oh, the, yeah the spectacle yeah. is yeah. just astounding because it is you know that you're sitting close fairly close to the screen wherever you're sitting in the yeah. theater you know it's almost total immersion so it's yeah. very it's really enveloping 
Um, and um, and that's also Tracy Reiner. I want to add, who's wonderful in that in that in that clo it's a two shot right, with right, with right, Kathleen right, Quinlan right. and Tracy Reiner. But the the balance between sort of the w what you pick up from the performances and the spectacle makes it a pretty rich uh, experience. You know, j when we, we uh, when John Glenn saw the movie in Houston when we premiered it there in Houston, uh, this is not the IMAX version. This is but in the initial release, he came up to me and he said. It was like I was living a launch That's all over again, and he got this gleam in his eye, and I swear to you that he began lobbying to go on the shuttle after that. I guarantee, I guarantee you. Juan was very worried about showing this premiere, the regular movie, it, to the NASA people, because he was afraid that, you know, they'd been so close to the, the program that, that they would criticize the movie and it would get out in the newspapers that, hey, this was not right, that was not right. Mm. But they were really thrilled with the movie. Everybody who saw it that was associated with NASA said that's the greatest movie. Because it captured the emotion and the feel. Yeah, and a real, the, yes, that's right. Yeah, you know, there could have been some wrong things to it, but I mean, it, it, it so captured uh, the idea of going to the moon and, and the, the, what the people felt, uh, what the astronauts felt, what the flight controllers felt, and all the, the job they were doing. That they, Hey, they would do it for nothing, you know, because they so enjoyed the, the movie or so enjoyed the job. And Ron put that whole concept into the movie so the audience would then get that same feeling. And he did an excellent job of editing this IMAX version yeah. to keep that going without losing the, the, the real thrust of the movie. When, 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 <laughs> my boys have laryngitis. When you look up at the moon, do you see it differently? I mean, what do, what do you see? Well, it's not as romantic, Charlie, as it used to be. <laughs> uh, I, I, I say, you know, can I, was I really there? Did I really go there on Apollo 8? Did I go back on Apollo 13? Was I disappointed that I didn't land? Yes. Up until, I think, years later when I said, well, 13 was a disappointment. It was a failure. But in some aspects, it was really a triumph to the, the ability of people, of the ground control people working with the flight crew, to get a almost certain catastrophe back to a successful recovery. Oh, it's, I think it's it, it, you know it's one of their most successful endeavors. Mm -hmm. The fact that they will pull that off, don't you? I do too. And 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 of course, at the time, it was sort of I mean, it was reported, but it wasn't really understood quite the level of jeopardy yeah. that and and uh, um, by the time I learned. Um, you know the details of the mission, and also this balance, this this tremendous commitment that the mission controllers felt to to get these guys back. I mean, when I when I was doing research, one of them explained to me. He said, "You know, imagine you're a mash surgeon, and your your best buddy from high school just got dragged in off the front line and is dying. Well, you're going to do everything you can as a surgeon to keep that man alive." And that's the way we felt about these guys who were like brothers to us, uh, uh, who were, you know, up there in, in, in trouble. Right. And when I understood that, it, I, began, I began to really, um, you know, sort of dramatically develop uh, the, the human side of the story and the emotional side of the story. For roll tape, take a look at this. Okay, I, okay, I got it. This was one of the things, a technique you developed for Apollo 8. Didn't think you'd ever use it, ripped it out of the manual, didn't have it with you. That's right. And all of a sudden, you know, when we were out of the corridor and had to get back in the corridor for a safe landing, they called up and said, Say, Jim, do you remember back on Apollo 8 those procedures that you had in the back of the flight manual? I said, yeah, we tore them out after that. He says, you'll have to use them now. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Oh, the, uh, I should also mention James Horner's score. It's a, uh, you know, he it was really no he was nominated that year. It's a great score. But again, IMAX uh, also, you know, works with the sound. We completely remixed the movie. And it's one of the things that sort of makes it, uh, you know, even more enthralling and, uh, the, and the action scenes, you know, more, more intense. It definitely, the movie flows more and, and uh, it's, it plays more like an action adventure movie in a lot of ways. And I really, when I see it, you know, I really feel that in some way this great story kind of always was destined to be seen in this format. 
what's the future for IMAX now that they've got this software? Because other movies like Gladiator mm. have been put on IMAX, but well, they had that grainy quality. Well, they just all they do is project the, the 35, 35 millimeter up, or, right. or the or, you know onto the big screen, and it's not not the same thing at all. Uh, Look, I think it's very exciting. I, I don't, I don't, you know, I will yet to be uh, known what the, uh, the the economic, you know, ramifications are of this of this kind of reissue. But you know, Brian and I were talking about it the other day. It may also be an exciting possibility to go out concurrently with just a handful of prints in these pre in, and premiere kind of in these uh, IMAX uh, uh, theaters at the same time that you're going out with your normal two or three thousand screens. Uh, as as well, you know that's a possibility. It's exciting as a movie goer. You know, it's uh, it, it's it's it it just takes you that extra step toward being utterly transported. That you know, sort of I love as a movie goer, and of course I, I always strive for as a as a as a director. It's uh, you know I think it, I'm really excited about it. You went from what a gr the Grinch to, to Grinch to, to Beautiful to Mind. Beautiful Mind. Right. And where are you going from Beautiful Mind? Hi, I'm working on a number of scripts, uh, Charlie, and I don't know quite what I'm going to do. I'm eager to get behind the camera again. I've had a little rest, and, and, yeah. and it's time to get with you it. You take off some time after the Oscar. I did, yeah, yeah. I did a little traveling. Uh, I was able to spend some time with the family this summer, and and uh, uh, but uh, you know, definitely uh, looking forward to, to to finding something. And I have a number of stories, great stories, and it's really just a matter of kind of getting the casting together and getting the scripts. Uh, well, at first they said you were going to do the Alamo. Then well, we're still producing okay, the Alamo. Yeah. Brian and I are producing the Alamo. Directing it? Well, look, there was a, there were a number of a number of of, of factors. Um, you I, I, and I never committed to directing it. And uh, uh, by the way, it was reported that I was absolutely doing it. It was a it was a it was a done deal. Not not really the case. Although I was I was very interested in the story. Did a lot of research, but I'd say if there I was going to choose one one sort of issue, the my approach to the story was was a lot tougher. I want I wanted to do a hard raw. Um, rather graphic w war story, and it's going to be—it was going to be an expensive movie. It's reported that it all fell apart over economics. That was not 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 the case. We wouldn't do that, you know. The, uh, but I did feel that for me, right at this moment, um, if I was going to tell that story, I wanted to tell it as sort of truthfully and realistically as I possibly could, and that would probably yield an R rating. Um, and uh, Disney really felt that if they were going to make that kind of investment. That um, with that story, they wanted to be PG-13. They wanted, you know, they wanted kids to be able to go to see the movie. This is a hundred and fifty million dollar movie. Not going to be that. It wasn't going to be that much. And and uh, John Lee Hancock is now directing, uh, mm. and it'll be, you know, it'll be uh, a, a, a little less than if I made it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but is Texas going to be happy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, some, some look. That's always going to be a controversial story. Okay. Some in Texas are going to be happy. What's controversial about the story? Oh, you know, it's um, uh, it's controversial in that. Uh, That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> it's controversial in that, um, uh, you know, at that time, uh, Texas belonged to Mexico, and this is really this is not the story of America coming in and annexing Texas. That's not what was happening. But it was a Texas Revolution, per perhaps su not supported but encouraged by Andrew Jackson and the United States government, and perhaps not. No one quite knows. That's controversial, uh, and you also have to look at it as w as a revolution. It was a number of people revolting against a an established government led by uh, General uh, Santana. So what's wrong with this so far? I mean, that's fine. Well, it's all pretty interesting, but people, you know, if if the if it's if it's played sort of, um, uh, you know, they, if some some people feel like, for example, the John Wayne version right, I mean, was uh, too sort of jingoistic or right, something. Sure, think, you sure, know, sure. so it's just trying to find that balance, which I was interested in. John Lee Hancock is also interested in it. He's, you know, his his screen his version of it and his screenplay is coming along great. And well, I think it would be a terrific. When movie. you talk about the gritty of it, I mean, you. A, a war movie that looks like Saving Private Ryan did in the first 25 minutes. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, it's a different kind of warfare, but no, I wanted but to have that latitude. Same element. It's I the, wanted to have that latitude. It's a horror war. Yeah. Whereas if you look at a studio executive in the eye, I look at a Disney, and I say it's going to be PG-13. I promise you, it'll be fine. Then I, I don't want to play any games with them. I want to mean that. And I wasn't sure. That's a vague line. And uh, so I wanted the latitude to be able to go tell the story. And uh, you know, I might have been able to wrestle around and kind of fight for that and gain it, uh, but um, it's not the kind of relationship that I want to have with a studio when I'm making a movie. It, involved in Apollo 13, the movie, did you get any great? Did you fall in love with the movie business? 
I, I did for this movie. I, you know, I had not known too much about movies or actors or actresses or how they were done. And so I was a little worried when uh, the uh, book was sold uh, to, uh, uh, you know, the Imagine yeah, Entertainment. <laughs> I said, you know, I've heard a lot of, you know, wild stories yeah, you know, about, you know, egos and everything yeah, like that. Me too. But I have to tell you quite honestly, and not just because Ron is here, but I, you know, that was the greatest group of people to work with. These guys worked their tails off during that short period. I found out that the actual filming was only, what, three and a half months, something like that. Yeah. And there's a lot of pre-production, a lot of post-production, but they really worked hard. But uh, Ron and I got together one time because I, they asked me to be a consultant, but he said, look, it, uh, it's okay to be here sometime during the filming, but it's sort of, you know, uh, it's sort of hard for a good actor, even like one like Tom Hanks, a superb actor, to 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 portray somebody who's still alive and yeah. hanging on the back exactly. of the camera. And mm -hmm. I said, you're absolutely right. I said there also be my tendency would be Tom, uh, step aside. We got to show you how this is done. <laughs> uh, there's also that. Remember in the script? Well, we, you reminded me of this. That uh, they had your nickname all over the screenplay. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and it was a nickname you weren't too fond of. It was Shaky. Shaky. <laughs> shaky. Well, yeah, they, they re did a lot of research. At one time, some of the guys called me Shaky, and I hated that. I hated that. And so when I, when I met Ron, he said, look, it, I read about you. You're, you're called Shaky. If you don't call me Opie, I won't call you Shaky. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you both. Yeah. When this thing starts, uh, September 20th. Yeah, in about only about yeah. 22 theaters yeah. uh, throughout the country, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, I hope that people will experience it for the first time if they haven't seen it. Just yeah, seeing that, see it again if they have. Yeah, we're, we're, we're happy. That we, and you yeah. know, the, I think it was a win-win situation. Everybody was happy. NASA was happy. The you know the people that, were, that they portrayed were happy, and I'm sure that Universal and Ron and the oh, yeah. <laughs> of course they are. Great <laughs> they make yeah. some money. Great, Great to see you again. Nice see Congratulations you too, again. Okay. Yeah, well deserved. Thank you. Thank Jim. You. Thank you, Charlie. Good to see you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.